Great. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, my job is to give an overview of this new world of spatial transcriptomics. Let's go for it. Um, so my name is Trevor Pugh. I'm a senior scientist at Princess Margaret, and I direct the genomics program here at OICR. Uh, the surprising fact about myself, I'm also a graduate of CBW. I think I took it as a graduate student 10 plus, 15 plus years ago, uh, in one of the very first uh, cancer genomics courses. So that you can go all sorts of places with some of the skills that you'll learn here. Um, and this is the first time we're running a spatial uh, single cell RNA sequencing class. So today I'm going to introduce the conceptual shift from bulk RNA sequencing, which I'm hoping several of you have been exposed to, and the movement into single cell, uh, spatial or not. Uh, learn the types, some of the parameters, and trade-offs when trying to choose a technology. This is probably the number one question I hear from students and collaborators. There's lots of ways to look at single cells. What makes the most sense for my scientific question? And usually that's kind of a back and forth with a few loose parameters that uh, we'll talk about. Uh, I'm a cancer researcher, so I'm going to talk a lot about cancer, uh, brain cancer specifically, uh, and think about, um, basically show uh, some of our data using droplet-based glioblastoma work, and then our move of that project into spatial, uh, into spatial transcriptomics, and then talk about with some of the um, sort of opportunities in emerging absolutely massive single cell and spatial data set specifically in brain. So the first, um, first concept, we're all made of cells. So that's sort of the functional unit we're going to be talking about today. But we're not just a bowl of M&Ms. We're really cells that have structure. They interact. They change over time. Uh, they interact physically. They also interact functionally. So a cell on one side of the tissue could excrete something that's going to influence a cell on another side of the tissue. And all of this is now measurable. Up to this point, it's been largely uh, measurement by inference, but now we can literally look at these individual cells and look at the transcripts active uh, in each of them. That being said, single cell analysis is really not new. We've been looking at single cells, we've been looking at chromosomes for decades, probably even before I was born. Um, I just showed an example here, that's actually in the upper left, that's um, chromosomes from one of my white blood cells dropped on a glass slide, and you just literally look at them and look at banding patterns. Now you don't have to look at single chromosomes. We have next generation sequencing. Let's see, look at every chromosome from every cell. And I've just shown an example there of sort of a modern version of a carrier type where you're looking at coverage to infer gains or loss of chromosomes. Um, single molecule or single uh, species RNA-seq is something that's already been done even clinically within the cancer hospital. So the lower left is a in situ hybridization of one probe against one viral transcript. And now you can do the exact same concept across thousands, and actually now it's tens of thousands of transcripts all simultaneously at once. So with these tools in your hands, what do you want to do with them? Um, the conceptual shift here is really moving away from an average of all transcripts in your cell to precise measurements of individual cells. So I've shown on this little toy example, six cells that are all expressing different transcripts at different levels. Bulk sequencing, still very useful and powerful tool, gives you an average. So if you look at the average, all these transcripts would look the same as if they're expressed at the same level. But with single cell measurements, you can now look at in the level of individual cell uh, transcripts inside individual cells. And there's tons of ways to do this. So I put the title of the slide in quotes because that's a direct quote right out of this uh, review. Even though this re review is, I think, five years old now, a little less than that. Um, these are sort of the technologies that brought bulk RNA, bulk, uh, bulk cell, bulk tissue, I guess, analysis to the single cell space. And this concept of three broad areas, looking at cell lineage, cell state, and cell, cell trajectory are still very relevant. And they roughly map to many of the scientific questions that researchers are trying to address today. So lineage, looking at how cells relate to each other in a developmental context, cell state, especially in, in, immuno in immunology, this has been a very a hot application specifically looking at T cells, B cells, are they activated, exhausted, looking at the state of cells that are more or less understood, and then trajectory, how these cells change over time. And then the stem cell example, I'll show you how do some of these uh, progenitor cells give rise to, uh, to, uh, to offspring cells. Um, this review is really excellent, just introducing all the many, many technologies. We're just gonna focus on two of the boxes, specifically the single cell droplet-based methods, but primarily the whole point for this course, the spatial position of, of single cells. Uh, I put this one also in quotes. This is also 
re also held very true over almost 10 years, this exponential scaling in the number of cells that you can analyze in a single uh, experiment, starting up in the upper left, literally an Eppendorf tube in a single cell doing microbiology essentially by hand, moving to plates, moving to microfluidic devices, robotics processing hundreds of plates with hundreds of wells all simultaneously, uh, shifting then into droplets, so encapsulating cells inside of oil droplets, doing your, your microbiology there. And then where we are now, which is really in situ analysis, not having to break up or move the cells around, have a tissue section and looking at, at uh, transcripts and cells as they sit within a, uh, within a tissue. And you can sort of see that X, the y-axis here is number of cells and that um, exponential growth just in the sheer number of cells that you can process in a, a single experiment, uh, increasing over time. And this has been doubly amplified by the massive drop in, or continued drop in sequencing reagent costs. So the sequencing-based methods also continue to be more tractable um, with lower budgets. And this is where we are now. So really the movement from looking at cells in plates or in droplets and really looking at those cells in place. This is a marketing image. It's very quite beautiful from, from 10X Genomics. Uh, but really the only additional piece of information is a matrix of XY coordinates. So it's still just cells by gene expression. You just get a bonus table that tells you where every cell is in relation to the other. Um, these images, I think, are quite useful try for trying to uh, generate hypotheses. But really, when you're doing your bioinformatic analysis, it's really just yet another data table with distances between cells. So think of spatial transcriptomics really as just trying to look at, to navigate this table of positions. And there's lots of questions uh, that you can answer with those XY coordinates. And one they've shown here is local neighborhoods. You have a cell, how often is it close to a similar cell or a different uh, cell? Or are there common cell-cell um, neighbors that you see more likely than you'd expect by chance? And I'll show some examples of those. Uh, so now cell organization and cell state is fully measured at all biological cell scales. So cells, tissues, Full organisms, and if you're looking at multiple organisms, you can actually start to look at populations and navigate all these many different levels of resolution computationally uh, yourself. Uh, so I just show this example here with um, the 10X Genomics Group has taken a mouse pup. They've been sectioned, but now you can look at uh, a panel of genes across literally every single organ in an entire uh, organism. Um, so you can, if you have a gene that you think is important in brain, maybe it's important in bladder, maybe important in lung. You can really, and it's now actually a point and click interface where you can zoom in and navigate um, each individual organ one by one, but also perform computational analyses that can take organ-based clusters and distance-based metrics uh, into account. And this review just on the right-hand show, side shows all the creative applications that people have come up with to uh, make use of this uh, spatial information. So how do you do this? So there's going to be a major module just on the wet lab work as computation biologists. It's extraordinarily important that you understand how your data got to you, what happened to your cells, what happened to your tissues um, before you got your data. Um, this also ties into the technology selection uh, question as well, which we'll I'll get to right at the end of the talk. Generally today, there are three very broad buckets of laboratory protocols for spatial transcriptomics. There's sequencing based, which are largely uh, grids. So basically they have a, a carpet of, I almost think of them as, as circles. You put your tissue down on top. If you're lucky, you have a cell that lands perfectly inside of that circle. That rarely happens. Often you'll land on the border of a circle. Uh, the first round of this technology, the circles were quite big. So you had five or 10, sometimes 20 cells landing on each circle. So you had to deconvolute the cells that are in there. But the circles on that grid are now getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so that's what this capture-based method is showing. This has the advantage in that it's poly A prime, so you're un sequencing all of your transcripts in an unbiased way. So you can get true full transcriptome. You don't have to impose a short list of genes you might be interested in. And it leverages the power of next generation sequencing, which as the costs fall, continually continues to get more and more affordable. Uh, the other method is also a sequencing-based method called in situ uh, sequencing. This uses a technology called uh, rolling circle amplification. Essentially, it takes your transcript and just makes a circle and allows it to hyper amplify a single molecule into hundreds or thousands of copies. Uh, this has the advantage in that your product doesn't move, it stays in place. And then you image uh, the, um, the, uh, the fluorophores that are be, uh, basically being bound to each of those transcripts. 
This method is quite sensitive. It's more sensitive than the array-based method. It has a challenge here in that you have to essentially learn where the borders of your cell are. And this is actually a major challenge in spatial transcriptomics. What is a cell? What are they shaped like? They're not nicely behaved circles like they might look like in this figure. Cells are messy. They've got little projections. They interweave with each other. Just trying to define what is a cell is still a like a fundamental challenge in spatial transcriptomics today. And I, that's actually something you're gonna get into uh, in this workshop as well. And how do you turn the dials on those segmentation algorithms to say, here's my cell and here are the sequence that are, that are inside of it. Uh, the third method is in situ hybridization. Just like that first example I showed with that single probe against a single virus, that conceptually you can now do thousands of, of probes, uh, probes against thousands of uh, transcripts all simultaneously. This is the most sensitive method, but has the downside in that there's not yet a complete probe set for the entire transcriptome. So you have to choose a short list of initially 400 transcripts. Now it's just under 1,000. The plan, I think, is to scale to whole transcriptome. But for today, you have to choose a list of transcripts that you're very, very interested in. But this approach does have the benefit in that you can go very, very deep and have very near single molecule uh, 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 limit of detection uh, for your transcripts of interest. Uh, and here's just one example. It's not like a marketing slide for 10X, but they've done a very good job commercializing all three of these types of technologies. Uh, the top is droplet-based. You take your tissue, digest it. Did it show up? Yeah. Um, you take your tissue, digest it. A lot of you may have used the Chromium X platform. Uh, in this case, there is a, a probe-based step, and you make uh, basically data analysis but lose the spatial context. The two spatial uh, approaches are down here. One, you have an H and E slide, which is actually probably the, I guess, the diamond in the rough. There's a huge amount you can do with these H and E si slides just for image analysis on their own. And then you layer on. This, this is a, the grid-based method. You can layer on uh, gene expression levels within each circle within the grid. And then Xenium um, is a probe-based method. Probes hybridize to your transcripts of interest. I uh, use this rolling sample circle amplification to boost the signal so you can see these single molecules, but really has that challenge of where does the border of one cell start and the other one end. So really the need to do segmentation of your images, sometimes guided. I think the opportunity here is to be guided by the H&E images, uh, but then to overlay those transcript level, um, those transcript level measurements as well. Uh, there's been a recent uh, enhancement of the Visium technology. So this is the grid-based method or the spots usually used to be quite large, so five to 20 cells per spot. And now these cells are quite, or the grids are quite small, and they're actually uh, subcellular in size. So you can now start to look at not just cell level, single cell, but also subcellular resolution uh, as well. So that's the move from the Visium to the Visium HD platform. So that's a list of technologies with some um, pros and cons. How do you choose a method? So I cut up that, that first figure I showed you showing all the three technologies. And this review I've just listed here at the bottom really does a great job stepping through all six of these different parameters that you should think about when you're trying to choose a uh, spatial transcriptomic approach. Gene throughput, do you actually need to know the transcriptional state of every single transcript? Probably go the sequencing based approach, but maybe you really only care about a short list of transcripts. 50, 100, 200. This is where going a more targeted based approach that's potentially more sensitive, especially looking for low expression targets, uh, may be a uh, better technology for you. Uh, do you need the sequence information? Then of course you're gonna need to use a sequencing based method. If you really only care about gene expression, the sequence is kind of going to be uh, potentially lost uh, or not used in that experiment. Sensitivity, are you going after these very low transcripts, five, six transcripts per cell, maybe less? Uh, this is where you probably want a more targeted, sensitive, uh, sensitive-based approach. Um, balance that against um, whether you need sequence information. So there's a trade-off there. Uh, resolution: Are you okay just having a gridded array? Maybe you don't actually care where your cell borders are. The gridded array-based methods uh, like Visium may be fine. Uh, area size: Do you want to analyze the entire slide, or do you just need a small pocket? Are you only interested in Lymphoid structures, you could zoom in and really do a deep dive on a certain neighborhood within a tissue, or do you really want to do an agnostic uh, approach? And probably most important is feasibility. What do you have access to? Is there a core that you can ship your samples uh, to? You have huge tissues. Do you have little tiny bronchoscopies that are super tiny? Are they just biopsies? 
So really looking at what you have and then what is feasible with the available technology. And these six axes are kind of the, the parameters that you want to think about when you're trying to ask and answer your scientific questions. So I mentioned I'm a cancer researcher. Cancer is an amazing application for these technologies because cancer is so, um, I guess, rule breaking. The tumor, the cancer cells grow all over the place. There's all sorts of cells that shouldn't be there. The cancer cells are differentiating down all sorts of odd developmental pathways. They're turning on pathways they shouldn't be. Really fascinating uh, disease to be looking at, especially in brain, which is so heterogeneous, um, using spatial and single cell technologies. Uh, cancer also has the other challenge in that they change over time. Cancer patients get treated. I can select for cancer cells. I can boost up immune cells. And we can actually measure uh, the dynamics of these cells using this new technology. So I want to tell the story of uh, how we first got into single cell. This started out as a glioblastoma stem cell project. We're interested in these very rare cancer stem cells. You have a single stem cell that gives rise to the bulk tumor. And current treatments, chemotherapy, for example, debulk the tumor. You kill the bulk cells, but the cancer stem cells are still there. And they actually give rise back to a new tumor that actually doesn't share very many of the genetic features of the, of the, of the primary tumor. And you sort of get this expansion and contraction. This is really what makes GBM so hard to treat. Um, the whole goal around this, uh, this group, this is a collaboration with Gary Bader and uh, Peter Dirks, really trying to understand cancer stem cells and therapeutically take them out and then let the bulk cells uh, die and fall apart, but take out those, those progenitors. So going in, that was our question. We wanted to find these rare cells and we wanted to understand them. Uh, we had two approaches. This was experimental. So this was before we had spatial transcriptomics. We took bulk tumors. There's two ways to digest and grow these. So one by Peter's group and one by Sam Weiss in Calgary, uh, both cultured in different ways. They both basically have the same effect in that you get a purified cancer stem cell population. And they know they're cancer stem cells because they could dilute the stem cells down to a single cell uh, limiting dilution, put it into a mouse, and it would grow back the entire tumor. So you knew that this one single cell could actually grow back a tumor. And this is what we want to do. We want to understand each of those individual cells at the single cell level, starting with droplet. And what we found was every patient had a different glioblastoma stem cell. They had different drivers. They had different transcriptional um, uh, pathways that were active in each of them. Um, this is a UMAP basically showing all these cancers all forming really beautiful independent expression clusters. There was some relationship between tumors from the same or lines glioblastoma stem cells uh, lines established from the same tumor, but they weren't identical. So even within the same tumor, you had these transcriptionally distinct populations. So they were all different on their face. And our question was, do they share any common biology? And doing principal components analysis essentially discovered these two axes, a uh, developmental program and an injury response program, where uh, most of the GSCs were either on one end of the spectrum, but more developmental-like, or there are more on the injury response uh, side of the spectrum. And we want to understand why this was. So we profiled thousands of GSCs from a large number of tumors. And we saw in general GSCs, they're kind of well-behaved. They sort of inhabited their own lo local neighborhood. There is a distribution there, but we were able to be very quantitative about where on this transcriptional spectrum uh, these glioblastoma uh, stem cells developed. And this was really a whole new paradigm for glioblastoma, where at the time, there was a huge amount of work trying to bucket GBMs into one of four categories. And there were three or four papers all came out around the same time that really all discovered uh, almost the exact same gradient, all using different technologies. We did single cell, there's a metabolomic group, there's a proteomic group. They all rediscovered the exact same transcriptional gradient. Uh, and the lesson there was, it really didn't matter what technology you used, the biological signal was measurable using multiple different approaches. The other finding once we moved out of our GSC, so here's our, uh, our developmental to injury response gradient. Once we'd done all that work on the purified glioblastoma stem cells, we turned to tissues. We want to know what are these uh, stem cells doing in a bulk tissue? We still didn't have spatial at the time, so we we're just looking at single cells. And what we found that the bulk uh, tumors were actually, tumor cells were actually fountaining out of the glioblastoma stem cell gradient. So you had the stem cells up top, and they were giving rise actually to the same astrocytic lineage. So we actually had two axes at play, the developmental gradient in the stem cells, and then the bulk tumors, actually probably better shown in these two figures on the, on the side, essentially be all, be all rushing out of the stem cell population. 
And so that's perhaps a question like, this is a very interesting hypothesis. We see it in our droplet-based data. Is that what we actually see in real tumors? So this is still research that's ongoing. So Shamini is leading this uh, in, in the lab. Uh, this is an H&E image of a, of a piece of glioblastoma, so a, a tumor. You can see it's on a glass slide. And to save money, we actually snuck two tumors onto the same glass slide. So this is all from one patient. So grade four glioblastoma. And this is really our opportunity to ask the question, what's the distribution of stem cells within an entire tissue? We could never do that before. We had a bunch of leads and we had a short list of transcripts that defined that transcriptional gradient. So we went the panel-based approach because we knew exactly what genes were important. And we want to ask a super specific question. That's probably my number one piece of advice. If you are going to be doing spatial transcriptomics, be extremely nitpicky and precise in exactly the question you're trying to answer. It's extremely easy to just get derailed down 10 different rabbit holes and never get any of your work done. Just choose one question and pursue it absolutely relentlessly. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. We're trying to say, what are these stem cells? Are there like a starry night? Are there thousands of them? Are they forming little islands that are pushing off bulk tumors? What's going on here? Uh, and to do that, we applied this custom 300 gene panel that represented that entire gradient from development to injury. Um, so this is H&E, this is just a photograph. This is real data. So this is just coloring the cells by how many RNA pieces of RNA do you see? So the scale is enormous, 200,000 cells in one field of view, 200 transcripts per cell, obviously an underestimate, at least with droplet-based methods, we usually see between two to 5,000 uh, transcripts. But this is not unexpected because we're using a panel. We're only looking at a subset of the genes, but they're the genes we care most about. Transcripts are within the cells, so this highlights the challenge of segmentation. If you don't have perfect segmentation, then you never will. You're not going to capture every single transcript within a cell. Uh, density of cells is going to depend on your tissue. And you get this nice size distribution as well. So this is where your knowledge of your sample comes into play. If you have a lot of massive cells, you have a bunch of small cells, this is kind of average is what I've shown here. And then is the number of genes per cell what you expected based on your panel design. This is the exact same image again. Now, instead of just counting transcripts, we ask the question, what are they? Are there transcriptional patterns or clusters within our, within our tissue? This tissue is extremely complex and you can tell by eye spatially, it's probably going to be the starry night story. There's not these beautiful islands of stem cells, which I kind of thought we were going to see when we came in. That's not the case. In glioblastoma, these cells are spreading all throughout the brain. Maybe this is not so surprising. But you can see by eye, there are these little tantalizing transcriptional groups that actually are structured. And they, actually, um, they actually are forming uh, structures that you can see by eye. And if you take all of this data, throw away the uh, XY matrix, and just look at the transcriptional identity, you can see very cleanly these nicely structured transcripts are all grouping very nicely into a single transcriptional platform uh, group. And if you look at the cells that define those groups, they're very likely immune cells. Same over here, blood vessels. If you look at, there's some little structures in here that are actually nice, nice round, well-behaved uh, blood vessels. And transcriptionally, that actually bears out as well. And then the tumors are this huge mush. And this is really where we're at now, is trying to understand a lot of the transcriptional structure and zooming in specifically on the cancer cells to see whether we can see uh, first recapitulate that transcriptional gradient in 2D space, uh, but also look at whether there are different dependencies between clones within a complex tissue like this. So that's where we are with our GBM project. Totally new, really exciting technology. And we really had to reason our way through why we're doing the experiment and then what technology made the most sense for our very focused question right on, uh, focus specifically on the transcriptional gradient. Um, this review I just found a couple of days ago, really showing all of the spatial, uh, spatial transcriptomics work that's been done in cancer over the last two years. And I was absolutely blown away. Basically, there's been a project in every single cancer type. Um, and if you look at the slide when you have time later on, just how meticulously specific every one of these questions are. Essentially, uh, groups with a very intense focus on one or two different cell types took this technology, but then did this in intensely deep dive on one or two cell types of interest. Uh, so very important scientifically in that now they understand their favorite cell type of interest in the context of tissue, but also a huge data opportunity because all this data is shared openly and then you can actually reuse this data to answer your own questions. 
So I really, um, when you're designing your spatial transcriptomics experiments, I really encourage you to look at the reference data that's out there and download it and try analyzing it yourself so you can see if you can project your own new data into the context of all of this uh, existing data. Uh, specifically in brain, there's been similar uh, research intensity, specifically looking at normal brain development. So this is a review looking at all the single cell, single nuclei and spatial uh, data types. This is from 2023. So almost all the dots here are nuclei or single cells, but you can see there's some green dots. There's some spatial transcriptomics data set sneaking in there, ALS, all sorts of different uh, diseases here. I think this image is gonna change basically all green probably in the next couple of years as a lot of groups have taken what they've learned from the droplet-based analysis and now are using that to pursue hypotheses in the spatial uh, context. Amazing opportunity for all of you because now there's all this reference data that you can go grab, download, and integrate with, uh, with, your, own, uh, with your own research. And probably the group that's done this the best is the Allen Brain Map. Amazingly powerful resource, really um, well-written web, web technologies for querying complex data, uh, data types. They have entire atlases just looking at the anatomy of brain. Uh, and started with h &E images, and they've really kept up with the technology very well. They have tons of spatial uh, data sets, tons of uh, just droplet-based single cell data sets, millions of single cells, the power analysis of, of uh, cell types, the circuits that underlie them, neighbor, neighbor, uh, neighbor cell, neighbor cell uh, interactions. And then this is just a short snapshot of all the atlases they've built. So the brain atlas is probably their most uh, famous and most, most multi-omic. They also have the mouse brain atlas really focused on development. The human brain atlas this is also tied to the human cell atlas, which is doing this for all organs and all tissues. And then a temporal aspect. So a developing mouse uh, brain. So if you're interested in uh, development, fetal development, a cancer co-op, developmental pathways, these are really powerful atlases to integrate into your own, uh, into your own work. And that's my time. So just to revisit what we just talked about, there's a huge number of technologies. Think really carefully about what each technology brings and what's feasible for the, uh, the sample types you have and the technologies you have access to. You can measure the same biology lots of different ways. So don't get too hung up chasing the technology. If the biological signal is loud enough, you should be able to see it and cut through some of the technical noise. That was certainly our experience with the glioblastoma project. Lots of ways to measure exactly the same thing. Uh, you can now measure not just cancer cells and immune cells, but all cells that inhabit a tissue. So you can have multi-cell type or cell type, cell type interaction hypotheses. And I've just listed the, um, the various uh, feature or uh, parameters that you can consider as you're looking at an existing single cell technology, or if there's a new single cell uh, spatial technology that's just coming out. So you can use that six feature framework to do uh, your own evaluation. Uh, so I'll, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so I'll leave it there. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions by email or throughout the workshop. Um, keep some of these con concepts in hand as you dive into your uh, bioinformatics work. So thanks very much. I guess I'll take questions now. Where's the